Hello and welcome to the North Coast Journal Preview, where we take a look at the stories being followed in the current edition of the North Coast Journal. I'm your host, Dave Frank, and I'm joined this week by Thad Greenson, News Editor, and Jennifer Fumiko Cahill, Arts and Features Editor at the North Coast Journal. Welcome, guys. How you doing, Dave? Pretty good. Got sunshine today. It's not as windy as it was recently. It's actually a really nice day. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that helps the cause. That helps the cause in these trying and difficult times. I love that Dave can, it like, you know, goes up and his fortunes rise and fall with the weather. I know. <laughs> it sets the tone. <laughs> it sets the tone. It's better than putting your finger to the wind on the news stories covering. That's true. Covered internationally. That's true. Because 100% inter- true. Internationally, there's been a lot of downers um, lately. And, you know, obviously the, the war in uh, Ukraine is something that's really got everybody kind of in a bad place. So we're going to not talk about that. And instead, we're going to talk about uh, what's on the cover story this week, Thad. Disaster. <laughs> <laughs> Well, how to avert disaster is really what's on the cover story on the cover this week. Um, we have a, a wonderful story from Kim Weir, our digital editor um, and senior staff writer, um, who um, took on kind of an update on what is going on with Humboldt County's uh, tsunami alert system. So, um, folks who frequent uh, local beaches, um, imagine, have seen um, these big towering um, poles with uh, with sirens on them and maybe wondered what they're about. Um, that's our, uh, our tsunami alert system, which is undergoing some changes, it looks like. So the article is really comprehensive. Um, and so I recommend people check it out. And also a bef- big shout out to your graphic artist because there's maps that show exactly where each of these, I think 15 um, sites are located, but uh, sort of sort of big picture. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how this article is framed? Um, these 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 towers. There's a there's the possibility that they we need to revisit, uh, you know, an upgrade or or not. And so, can you kind of frame that for us? What uh, what's at play here? Yeah. So the the story actually starts with um, the last time these sirens were were used, not in a drill, but in um, you know for an actual tsunami threat, which was um, just about 11 years ago. I think it'll be 11 years ago in, in a couple of days um, when there was the the big uh, subduction zone quake off of the coast of Japan, which spawned obviously a, a massive and deadly uh, tsunami there, but then also a cross ocean tsunami that hit here the next morning. Um, and so the story kind of opens with Troy Nicolini um, of the National Weather Service at NOAA's office on Woodley Island kind of deciding to push the buttons um, to kind of uh, trigger this massive warning system, which, as you said, has these 15 sirens throughout Humboldt County. Really, 12 of them are, are maintained by the county off of Office of Emergency Services. And then Shelter Cove has its own mini system that's of three sirens that's linked in. But um, so that was the last time these were were officially used. But um, the story kind of started. We started reporting the story with the premise that we'd heard that about half half of these things um, aren't working. Um, and so we started kind of looking into it. And it, it, five of them are currently offline um, because they're just of an age um, and subjected to so much kind of saltwater corrosion and stuff like that that they have crapped out. And um, and it's a technical term. Um, <laughs> And um, and the county is kind of in the midst of trying to figure out what to do with them. And in the mid in in the course of this is kind of, you know, they haven't officially announced this decision yet. But it really seems that they're all kind of thinking that these things are obsolete and that it's just they're too expensive and too expensive to maintain um, when they have pretty limited utility these these days. Um, you know, over the last year, eleven years, you know, cell phone technology has just become much more pervasive. We all have, um, or we all should have, digital alert systems on our cell phones um, and stuff like that. And so, you know, the prevailing wisdom is that um, those alert systems, coupled with um, kind of boots on the ground, um, analog technologies of sending officers door to door or um, sending, you know, low flying civilian aircraft to kind of sound um, a, an alarm that way. Is, is more cost effective and, and just as effective in getting people out of these low lying zones in the case of, um, of a cross ocean tsunami. So that's a great way to frame it. Thank you. And before we dive in on some of the details, you wanna just share with us like how these towers got here, how these sirens got here and, uh, and you know, uh, in the first place. Yeah, so actually former uh, second district supervisor Jimmy Smith was really instrumental in getting them here. And um, they used to be the sirens at the, uh, Dia- I think it's the Diablo Valley nuclear plant. Um, and uh, PG&E was, I think, in, in bringing in different sirens or new sirens um, there as they, they were going through the decommissioning process and um, basically gave them to Humboldt County. 
And so these are all old nuclear sirens, which are now dispersed around the, the Humboldt coast. I thought that was a pretty cool tidbit. Um, and so basically you said like when we when there, were, there was that large um, nine plus uh, magnitude uh, uh, earthquake back 10 years ago, 11 years ago. Um, now the system functioned properly in part. The, the, the criteria for that, I guess, was that there was a coordinated response and um, that it's integrated. So can you tell us mm -hmm. a little bit about how it currently functions and then if if you know what what that would mean if we if, if the uh, the what the decision is based on whether we need to upgrade them or not. Yeah, so the um, like you said, I mean, it's an integrated response. It is um, it is kind of layers of protection, if you will. Um, and so what happens is when um, the seismologists and, um, and oceanographers and stuff who are kind of monitoring the you know these large scale um, cross ocean events, and we'll get to in a moment to, to why these are really only effective for cross ocean events, but. Um, you know, the folks who are monitoring basically make the call of whether there's a real tsunami threat coming coming our way. And they have, you know, bu buoy monitoring systems across the ocean and stuff like that to kind of gauge the force and trajectory of a tsunami. Um, and so if they decided it, it, it does pose a real threat locally, um, they kind of launch this alert, which is, um, I think it's launched from the, the NOAA offices on Woodley Island. And, um, there, you know, there's kind of I liken a little bit to like the nuclear football that there's like a code that they punch in and it triggers both the sirens going off at in coordination at a set time. And so when they went, were set off to go off 11 years ago, they all triggered at 4.30 a.m. Um, and so they begin blaring um, at the same time. It cuts into television and radio feeds locally, um, interrupts them with a tsunami, tsunami warning message. And now the added layer above that is that the Humboldt Alert um, system, so folks who have, have signed up to, re, uh, to receive um, uh, emergency, either put calls or messaging, um, text messaging on their phones, um, would get the automated calls or the automated text messages warning of the, the coming tsunami. Um, and then there's also kind of the, like I said before, the boots on the ground response where they send um, officers with bullhorns to, um, to the low-lying areas and really the, the at-risk areas to um, warn folks to, you know, to evacuate and to move to higher ground. So the a question is, I think it's about a half a million dollars they estimate, and if they were to get federal money, then they would have to be some matching funds. So it'd be about twenty five percent local, seventy mm -hmm. percent federal. But they're questioning whether that's even um, a desirable use of even that limited. Not that that's a small amount of money, but they're questioning if if one hundred twenty five thousand even is worth it because mm -hmm. of uh, it. Is it really even um, necessary or useful at this point in time? Yeah, so I mean, it's they estimate about five hundred thousand dollars to replace the sirens, but then there's kind of the ongoing maintenance and operation costs. But I mean, it is when you're thinking about a, a county with a five hundred million dollar budget, um, general fund budget, or a state with a forty plus billion surplus. I mean, it does seem like maybe not a terribly significant amount of money for something that could really save you know a community um, from um, from inundation. But, you know, what, what, you know, and I was especially concerned about this when kind of this came on our radar is if you look at kind of the socioeconomic um, geographic overlay of Humboldt County, a lot of the tsunami at risk communities are really the, the more, you know, economically disadvantaged communities. So you're talking about King Salmon and Samoa and Manila up in Oryx. Um, and, you know, communities where you'd think that the digital divide is going to be more pervasive. And so um, I had the question of, well, like, are these digital alerts really going to be effective in, in getting to the people that need to hear the most or, you know, and, you know, through our reporting or through Kim's reporting, what we really found is that officials, you know, seem really confident that in addition to kind of like that layered system um, of digital alerts and radio and TV announcements and stuff, that they would really deploy, um, you know, the um, a, a civilian air force essentially to to fly the the coast, um, fly the coast with helicopters with bullhorns, telling people to get off and warning of the sun, of the tsunami, and that they would deploy fire departments and police officers to um, to do the same kind of on the roads. And they felt, you know, pretty confident that they would be able to contact everyone, um, you know, and including, you know, homeless communities, especially um, the encampments kind of on the Samoa Peninsula and stuff. And so this is a good time to, to like, put a fine point on it. You mentioned there's a difference between the types of tsunami that we can expect to come across the Pacific versus a, a locally generated earthquake tsunami. 
Yeah, and so and it's really important for everybody living in Humboldt County or visiting Humboldt County to know is that um, in the case, you know, the biggest tsunami threat for us here is the Cascadia subduction as a um, zone event um, directly off our coast. Um, and so this is the massive, you know, eight, nine plus earthquake that we we all fear. Um, and, you know, officials warn is, is imminent. It's going to happen at some point. Um, and in the event of an earthquake like that, um, there very likely will be a tsunami locally and it will hit the coast within minutes um, of the shaking stopping. And so, you know, what the officials, you know, tell us repeatedly is in those instances, Mother Nature is your warning system. Um, when the ground starts shaking and you are at the beach, that is the warning system to get off the beach and move up to higher ground. Um, and, you um, and in an event like that, it's they say it's really unlikely that the siren system would even be functional. Um, the earthquake would be so so large, it would probably lock, knock a lot of the equipment offline, and it would take long enough for officials to actually launch or to set the wheels in motion of the sirens going off, that by the time they're going off, um, lots of valuable time would, would have already been wasted. And so they're really thinking that the you know it's important to shift efforts to just an education campaign and making sure folks know that. And, you know, there's stuff in the article about um, some officials doing outreach with like ho local hotels and stuff, making sure that visitors to the area know of these, these tsunami threats and know, you know, again, that for that really large scale earthquake locally, that is your warning. And that's, um, that's all the, all you need to, to experience in order to know that it's time to get away from the coast and to higher ground. Yeah, you anticipated where I was going to go, which is basically like that's the takeaway here is that the, the county will decide um, through through a normal review process. But one of the recommendations, uh, it will definitely be an enhanced education campaign, um, mm -hmm. particularly, particularly for visitors uh, with the goal of saving lives for people that aren't as familiar with tsunamis. Mm hmm. Yeah. And the last thing I'll add on that is I remember reporting on the um, the tsunami in 2011 and um you know, I remember you know, waking up to the warning and posting, you know, things urging everybody to get away from low lying areas and stuff. And then the next thing we started hearing was all these people were driving out to lookout points and to the beach to watch the waves come in. And so, you know, last thing I'll say is if there is a cross ocean tsunami and there is an alert or even a warning issued, please don't go look at the waves. That's, you know, in 2011, the one person who was killed on the North Coast was killed um, up actually in Del Norte County, but killed because they went down to the beach to take pictures. So don't do that. We're not gonna run them. So just forget yeah. it. <laughs> We're not gonna run your tsunami pictures. Yeah, we don't want them. Nobody wants to see them. Your vacation photos, your tsunami photos, nobody wants to see them. Be safe. Yes. So with that, thank you, Thad. We really appreciate it. And I'm sure you will follow up. We'll hear more as the decisions made on how the county is gonna proceed. Thanks, David. Uh, how about you, Jen? Let's transition. What is going on on the Arts and Features beat this week? Let's transition. Um, we have a sort of an ongoing thing that's been on my mind and apparently on Leslie Castellano's mind. Um, and that is lots and lots of fast food popping up in Humboldt and uh, particularly in Eureka. So this week, um, I don't know if you've heard about it, but there is a, in the past couple of weeks, actually, there's been a big hubbub. The Los Coast Outpost first reported that the uh, Annie's Cambodian, the owner of that building, was going to combine that parcel and two others and turn it into a drive through likely with a Starbucks, um, and Annie's Cambodian would have to move elsewhere. Um, now, Annie's is on a month-to-month -month lease, and... Um, so they are kind of waiting for word about when this is going to happen. And the proposal is going before the uh, planning commission in Eureka on April 14th, I think it is. But it brings up some interesting questions because unlike, say, Arcata, which has a cap on the number of fast food places, um, similar to the cap I really tried to have with shoes, which is when a new pair comes in, an old pair has to go out. That plan failed miserably, but apparently it's working for Arcata in terms of okay. formula restaurants or chain restaurants. So um, I ended up storing a lot of shoes at work. Tell no one. Um, <laughs> but the, the plan to kind of keep the character of Arcata and the economy of Arcata more, more local um, is so far, you know, 
staying steady. Nobody's, it doesn't seem like anybody wants to repeal it or anything. Um, but Eureka has no such limit. Um, I talked to Kristen Getz of uh, the planning department, and she said, you know, if 90 people send in applications, we'll review 90 applications. And if you've looked at the change of Broadway going through Eureka over the last few years, it kind of feels like there's been 90 <laughs> applications. We've had a ton of chain restaurants. Um, some of them are franchises, some of them are not. Um, so the sort of general public's outrage over Annie's Cambodian is partly because they love Annie's. I don't know if, have you been to Annie's Cambodian? I like it. Yeah. What do you order? Um, well, I can't, I don't have a favorite. I just, yeah? I go, yeah, I go rando. Okay. Fish amok. That's my, my recommendation for you. Go have it next time, but it's all fantastic, but they're also a family run place. And you know, if you go there, you're used to seeing a member of the family in the kitchen through the pass window and seeing them cook. It's, you know, the same people all the time. And, um, you know, they're hugely popular. Uh, so popular that Annie's Cambodian won best Chinese restaurant in the Humboldt Best of one year. That's right. That's right. I never forget. Um, I know. It's in the name. It's in the name. Um, but anyway, it's hugely popular, and so a petition has started going around, and the petition asks the Planning Commission to consider a number of things, including, you know, this restaurant has made it through the pandemic, and it's a family-owned place, and they've been here for like 30 years at, you know, two different establishments, and, you know, they're a part of the community. They don't want to lose it. Also, they're concerned about, you know, traffic, and they're concerned about the character of our town, right? They're thinking about how Eureka looks when you're driving through it, what the, you know, local business culture is. And a couple of those things are things that the planning commission will look at, but it's not actually their job per se to think about the character of Eureka or to think about whether to preserve local businesses. They can think about whether or not there's a health and safety issue they can, you know, consider all kinds of things. But for the conditional use permit and the coastal permit and the, um, oh, my favorite, the design permit. Yeah, which, that's a funny one. Yeah, the design permit in which you determine whether it's, what is it? Ugly, hideous, it. gross. Do you have ugly, it? Yeah, ugly, oh. inharmonious, monotonous, uh, or hazardous. Describes all of my past apartments. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, the those are the things that they can consider. They can consider whether there's an environmental impact, whether or not it's blocking access to the coast, whether or not there's a traffic issue. Caltrans will have its say in terms of flow on and off the property. But there isn't too much to say in the way of we have too many fast food places or we have too many drive throughs because there's no such cap um, like Arcata has in Eureka. Eureka is a free-for-all of fast food. Um, I spoke briefly with uh, the fellow that owns the building, Victor Chang, through an LLC, um, and he his name is on another LLC's um, application for another Starbucks and Subway sandwich development to be put in where the Pine Motel is on Broadway. Um, so it's just Subway, Subway, Starbucks, Starbucks. Um, we already have some Starbucks on that street on 101 going through Eureka, but a subway too. And a subway. Um, and you know, there, there are lots of debates about the value or damage of fast food places. Um, Chang was saying to me, like, you know, for one thing, he was saying, I don't own the market, like I don't control the market. And that's very true. Because when you look at when fast food opens in Humboldt County, we have full on traffic jams and people staked out and local news propped up and reporting on the first burger to roll out of in and out. And, you know, we have local media going crazy over there's a new KFC, etc. cetera. Um, my husband weirdly remembers uh, being in the high school band or maybe junior high band and playing when a Kmart opened. We do the fanfare for change. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but so there's, you know, clearly a desire for this stuff. Um, 
whether or not it's good for us economically, um, I won't even get into the health issue. Um, that's another question. Um, Jang also had mentioned like, oh, you know, formula restaurants, like they, they get a bad rap, but they do give, you know, the opportunity for a business owner to learn a business and have a framework to work with it. But the truth is, while there are some locally owned, like the McDonald's are locally owned by one family, there's not a lot that's locally owned. Starbucks doesn't franchise. Chipotle doesn't franchise. In-N-Out doesn't franchise. The franchises that are around, like KFC, um, are owned by massive LLCs that have like 85 restaurants. They're not mom and pop restaurants. All of their produce, all of their materials come from outside. I think I'll have to check to see if it's still true, but I recall Burger King got its buns from France, but that was it. Everything else is shipped in. So we're not really putting money into the local economy and the profits are going straight out. Leslie Castellano, a uh, Eureka City Council member, um, has been thinking about this for a while, but the Annie's Cambodian thing brought it to the fore for her again. And she has asked to put on the agenda for the next uh, city council meeting to consider things like a moratorium or a cap on the number of um, drive throughs So she's asking staff to make a report and ask questions about economic impacts and things like that, traffic impacts, et cetera. And her feeling is she would like people to get out of their cars and yeah. see Eureka. And, you know, there are a lot of people who are concerned about, you know, people who are driving through Eureka, pull into a drive through and keep going and don't actually stop and see Eureka. Um, Cheng discussed this as like a bonus. He was saying, oh, you know, Eureka, Eureka could be, and this has got to be the least attractive way I've ever heard a, a place described, a food node. <laughs> okay. Um which is not the same as a burrito baby, which I've had. Um, <laughs> but, you know, that it could draw people in. And he was even saying that it could give extra business to local restaurants, that somehow it increases traffic and local restaurants will benefit. I have never heard this. <laughs> not, not from like a serious person. I'm sorry. Um, but, you know, Leslie Castellano was sort of chuckling and saying, nobody's ever said to me, Hey, why don't we get more fast food? Right, right. Um, and, you know, there's something to be said for one or two. I could see that theory working out. And if you're an economics person and I'm wrong, please go ahead and email me. I know you were going to anyway. Um, but we're starting to see a lot. Um, the Target, the corner of the parking lot of Target in Eureka is, um, has a proposal in to put in a trio of restaurants, drive throughs um, I believe it's a trio. It's a several uh, restaurant and multiple restaurant and retail spaces with drive throughs um, And those will, you know, definitely be corporate chains. Um, so the landscape of Humboldt restaurants, the landscape of Humboldt and what Eureka looks like as you're driving through it is really changing irrevocably um, or maybe not irrevocably, depending on what happens. Um, so I'm really eager to see how it plays out and, um, I'm eager to see where Annie's ends up. Um, Miles Slattery, among other people in the economic development department are helping to look for a place. And, um, actually when I spoke with, uh, Laura Chow Yang, uh, yesterday, just sort of following up and checking in with her, um, they were looking at some some potential places and, you know, she was hopeful. And, um, so cross your fingers that that works out. Um, certainly they'll have a, an instant, you know, following of people. They won't be starting from scratch when they move. Um, but it's going to be an interesting thing to see how the people of Eureka and the Eureka local government decides whether or not we are full up on, on fast food, at least drive throughs so thank you for this. Uh, you know, people have strong opinions about this, and, and a lot of folks say, oh, I'm not interested in politics or policy, but I think people are interested in this. So this is something that I'm sure we're going to follow and see how it goes. <laughs> yeah, we will. Well, thank you both very much. That's about all the time we have this week. 
North Coast Journal is available on newsstands now. Pick one up. Stay informed. Also available 24-7 online. Um, thank you both again. We really appreciate it and look forward to talking to you again next week. Until next time, take care, everybody. Thanks, See you next week. <laughs>